Fiction and reality. New stories, new ideas. Little Beth Entertainment. Welcome to episode 103 of The Rocketry Show at therocketryshow.com. This time around, we're joined by Joe Barnard, and we're going to find out what he's been up to over the last couple of years. Also in the mix, more listener feedback. We've got some feedback from episode 101 on the tracking and telemetry stuff, and also feedback from episode 102 with the Acronauts. That all happens right after this on The Rocketry Show at therocketryshow.com. Stay close. The Rocketry Show would like to thank the following patrons for their support. JohnRocket.com, Jason Rotney, Sean Falkingham, Joe S., Paul Olivieri, Sam Feinberg, Michael Aylward, Brian Jenkenberger, E. Hutnell, John Thompson, Mark McBride, Doug Wade, C. McCauley, Carl Hunting, the Piedmont Student Launch Team, Steve S., Chris Irving, Dave Simmons, SBR Fusion Rocket.biz, John Kusher, Christopher Short, Kelsey Black, Brian Reniker, and Jason Rodney. If you wish to show your support and become a patron of The Rocketry Show, just visit us at support.therocketryshow.com. Welcome to The Rocketry Show. All right, let's open the clock is a podcast that is all about advanced and high-power rocketry. Amateur-built rockets starting at mid-power to higher-power versions. This program is hosted by the team who loves the smell of burning rocket propellant in the morning. Here are CG, Gene, and model rocket guy, Jesse Yu. Welcome back to The Rocketry Show at therocketryshow.com. I'm CG, joined with Gene right now. Hello. And uh, and Jesse is, well, he's enjoying flying rockets with his club. Uh, it was, this is the last launch for a while for his club, so he's doing that. He's trying to make it in in time. So he may pop <laughs> in you know, at some point with us, uh, but that's okay. But the big thing is, is we've got Joe Barnard back with us. And you may remember him being on the show from time to time, maybe two, three years ago. Or something mm-hmm. like that when uh, when Joe was just getting started with things and he was in the beginning phases of figuring out how to get the the stability going up and then just the first inklings of flirting with landing a rocket with under rocket power. Um, so I don't know if you remember that, but if you go deep enough in the archives, probably on the Patreon uh, archives, you will probably run across that episode and we, we've been wanting to get Joe back on for uh, since then really to just to kind of <laughs> touch yeah. base and um one thing leads to another years pass by and we finally get joe back here on the show welcome to the show joe <laughs> thanks guys for having me i appreciate you uh running through the whole intro there but yeah it's great to be here great so you have been really really busy and uh you're you're like <laughs> ever so close to your goal so uh so you, t- you feel free to take your time and just kind of run through you know the you know the beginnings of you know learning and the and the and the mechanics behind let's just start with going up and then we'll go with going back down so keeping yeah. the rocket going up without fins under stability control and Jim, I know is going to ask a lot of questions because he's got one of your boards and he's been trying to figure that out so got two of them <laughs> so i'll i'll give the quick rundown here uh, I started, for those who, who don't know what I do, I build model rockets, uh, and I do it as my job now, which is crazy. Uh, I build a lot of them, <laughs> and they're all getting pretty advanced. Um, it started back pretty. in 2015. <laughs> pretty advanced. Yeah. <laughs> it started back in Just 2015 a little bit. Uh, when I was in Boston, uh, living pretty near the Rocket Noob by Dan. Um, and so it started back then with the goal of propulsively landing a model rocket, just like SpaceX, like Blue Origin, you know, we've all seen it at this point. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) And the, you know, of course, the problem with doing this is that it's just stupid hard. Like, you have to get a lot of things right, uh, and none of them can go wrong. So some some of the tech required to do that is, of course, like having really precise measurements of exactly where you are in the air, having some ability to control the thrust of the motor, having the ability to control the direction of the motor so you can steer the rocket. Mm-hmm. 
Um, you need to have a computer on board that has a good sense of time, that has a good sense of where it is. You need to have a good simulation so you know, you know how your flight is actually going to go. You can't really just run this thing a thousand times and put in a thousand motors or you're going to run out of money real quick. So there's all sorts of <laughs> stuff that's in your way uh, to, to get this done. And I've been slowly hacking down all the problems um, for the last five years or so. And it's definitely close. Um, but I've also been saying it's close for a while. So um, <laughs> I, I know the feeling. I'll try, to, I'll try to run through some major milestones, I guess. For like the first year, That'd be great. Yeah. Um, yeah, for like the first year, um, nothing really worked. Um, I was just kind of throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what stuck. I, I didn't have like an engineering background. And so I, I messed up a bunch of stuff that like, if you had gone to a traditional engineering school or taken, you know, traditional engineering course, you, you probably wouldn't have messed up. So the first year was kind of a wash, but just got my feet wet with coding, um, building little tiny computers, working with sensors, uh, trying to work mm -hmm. out how to build things in, in CAD. So computer aided design, you know, a lot of these parts are 3D printed too. So you're designing some custom parts. Um, and then the first time I got the up part, right, was about a year into the project. And um, I had a computer that just sort of barely worked. Um, I had a, uh, some, some software that was like kind of running sometimes-ish. <laughs> uh, and I got pretty lucky on some of the flights. Uh, I had, you know, some hardware that worked and I started getting flights that were going up straight. Um, and of course, the, the problem is when you spend, when you, you know, spend a bunch of time on this stuff, by virtue of that, like all of you who are listening know that you spend a lot of money on it too. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it just, it'll just, it's like a gas. It will like fill the vacuum that you give it. So however much is in your savings account, that's just rocket money. That's not savings. Um, <laughs> yeah. So at some point, you know, it, like that became a reality to me and I started selling kits uh, and uh, Jim has two of them, right? I do. I do. I absolutely yeah. do. And I love them. I'm, I tinker <laughs> with them. They're super fun. But yeah, so, so I developed these kits because I had been getting pretty good at um, the going up part, which is, of course, only half the problem for landing. Uh, and the kits <laughs> did fund the project, but they also s sort of stopped the landing project. As it turns out, right. uh, when you build something and sell it to people, there's customer support, there's writing manuals, there's maintenance, there's production issues. And so you turn into more of a manufacturer than a you know, person who experiments with stuff, which is fine, right. uh, but it gets old. So, so I sold these kits for a little while. I sort of put landing on the back burner. Um, and then about a year, let's see, maybe two years ago, I started trying to land again. So that, that would be fall of 2018. I started trying to do the landing right. stuff again. And I figured, well, I've gotten the up part, right? I've gotten the up part pretty much nailed down. What if I did the same thing as I had been doing, but I just focused on the down part? And that is what this thing called the, I made a rocket called Echo. Um, mm -hmm. And the whole goal was I would lift Echo up with the UAV and simulate the entire flight, or I would fly the, the entire flight uh, from Apogee down to the ground. So the rocket would be lifted up with the UAV, it separates from the, from, from the drone, and then it falls down, lights a motor on the way down, and then tries to land. So just like, right. you know, it's simple to try and get just the up part right, it's simple to try and get just the down part right. Mm -hmm. And parts of that are true, uh, and parts of it are not. So it took like a year and a half to start running into walls. But it turns out there are things that just are that like much harder to get right when you're hanging from a UAV for like 40 seconds as you ascend. Like you start getting less certainty in exactly where the rocket is or how fast it's moving. And gotcha. Um, yeah. <coughs> I was starting to run into issues with um the code base that I was using. So, so anyone who has ever written code before knows, like, if you write a piece of software, a piece of firmware over the course of three years, at 
at the three year point, you're going to start hating working with it. Yes. Like it, 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 <laughs> yes. there's all this stuff that, <laughs> that you wish you had done differently. You have all these functions that are starting to like depreciate and it's hard mm-hmm. to maintain something like that when you switched how you name your variables and you switched how you're <laughs> trying to set things up. And so, and, and you learn a lot as, as you're messing around. Yeah. Exactly. I ran into the same thing with the uh, flight computer for my, you know, rockets with dual deploy. And I started off with just doing the altitude only and, you know, and smoothing out the, you know, the, but the Kalman filters and getting used to that and everything kind of built out around that. So by the time I got to the beginning of this year, I was ready to start putting it in a rocket. And that's where I ran into problems with my old functions and the same exact thing. And it's, <laughs> and at some point, I was like, you know, screw it. I just took, I knew what I wanted yeah. to do. And the way I'm seeing it in my head is way more simple than what, what I came up with over the course of like two years or whatever. <laughs> so I just threw it all out the window and spent a month to rewrite it all. And I'm glad I did. So I, I totally know where you're coming from. I can see it. Yeah, and it's a thing that happens to everyone too. I, I was talking to someone yesterday who who was like complaining about the same thing. It's like, at, when you start the project with the clean slate, you write these beautiful functions that have like 12 different inputs and like are super <laughs> configurable. And then a year down the line, you're like, oh my God, who did this? Like, why? <laughs> yeah, why? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I was getting to that point with the, uh, with the echo code base. I was having a really hard time getting echo to work. At that point, what we were doing, I'm using SD's F15 motors. Um, that's like mm-hmm. a three and a half second burn at a average of 15 newtons. And they're great for this scale. If you have a rocket that's about a kilogram, you know, you're, you're well within the low class, um, low power, like rocketry class. So it's all safe to fly in like a public park. Um, and I was just trying to get the landing to work on timing the ignition correctly, you know, like timing it at the right altitude yes. or, or hitting it at the right altitude. And there's just there's only so close that you can get with that, you know, the first thing that anyone who's familiar with solid rocket motors is going to say about something like this is, well, how do you control the thrust? Since there's always mm-hmm. going to be little deviations, yeah. there are you know, inconsistencies. So with Echo, you can go on the, um, there's a YouTube channel. The name is bps.space. That's the name of the, the program. And if you look, there's a, there's a playlist of all of these landing attempts you see they start off pretty rough um, and they they sort of get better over time. But you can see I'm still running into these walls of accuracy and reliability. And um, right. anyway, so, so, so around like last fall, I took a break again from the landing stuff. I focused on revamping all of my flight software. I built this sort of air power, fan powered hopper vehicle to... Yeah. dial in the flight software. Um, this thing is called Sprite. It's really cool. And it sort of functions like a rocket, but it flies like a drone. Um, mm-hmm. And the idea was you could you could try rocketry software again and again and again without burning motors on it before you flew it on an expensive motor. That helped a lot. So that was the um, point of Sprint. Okay. I was, I was curious yeah, as yeah. to like, you know, because it seemed like a deviation on the outside, but there was a method right. to madness. Yeah, and I'm sorry to correct you here. <laughs> that was actually called Sprite. This is the most confusing thing, and I, I swear this is my fault. The hopper is called Sprite. The rocket yeah. after that is called Sprint. And then the rocket after that is called Scout. <laughs> it's like, I could not do a more confusing name scheme. Sorry. So, yeah, I, I did Sprite, which is the hopper vehicle. And then after that, I did Sprint. And the goal of Sprint Got it. was just a fun project to hone in the, um, the the stuff that I had learned from the hopper on an actual rocket. That worked really well. We did about, we did exactly 10 flights of that actually. Um, and after that, I got, I, I had built a new flight computer. I had, you know, built up this really nice code base. And I, I think I was like, okay, given the accuracy of the data from these flights to we were going to like mostly two to three hundred meters, and we did a couple of higher altitudes mm-hmm. flights. But um, given the accuracy of that data, I realized like I'm most of the way towards solving the stuff that I was running into with the Echo rocket. And so I figured, let's give this another shot. 
And instead of doing just launch or just landing, let's do it all at once. <laughs> and this was kind of <laughs> a, a scary idea, but let's do it all at once and let's try to get it right on the first try. Like, no holes Ooh. barred. We're going to try to land on the first try. <laughs> and yeah, all, all up test. <laughs> yeah. It would be, I mean, I don't think that's a great idea if you ever put people on rockets, but you try to you try to get everything right on the first try. But um, right. and anyway, I, it it ended up getting pretty close. So I spent I spent uh, August through mid November in a pretty aggressive test campaign where I fired a bunch more of those F fifteen motors to get a really good idea of what those thrust curves look like during different batches of motors. Um, different mm-hmm. firing environments, all that type of stuff that you would want to nail down for, for your certainty and how this is going to go. Um, and then I came up with this idea. As it turns out, the, the, the main problem with the F-15s isn't the thrust curve. Like once the motor starts burning on its normal profile, the thrust is mm-hmm. really predictable. Um, it's an end burner. You know, you're always, you, you always have almost the same amount of exposed propellant um, burning. Like, like the profile is pretty predictable for these motors. So basically, that, that just means the thrust curve is really consistent. And the only thing that's not consistent, the biggest variable, is the time between when you ignite, it, when you light the igniter, like when you send a command to the igniter, and when the motor begins burning on its main um, like profile, and we can classify that as like mm-hmm. the peak thrust when it kicks at at liftoff. Um, right. Are you seeing a variability of of the time to get up to pressure on the motor as well, exactly. or is it just yeah? Okay. It's like you know, it's if you think about the process of igniting one of these black powder motors, it's kind of a chaotic event. Like mm-hmm. you're you're. Depending on, I'm using those little fireworks igniters that pop really fast, and mm-hmm. so yes. sometimes they, depending on how they break open, they can hit like all of the propellant grain or half of it, and so that affects how fast these motors come up to thrust. And it's a, it's what we're talking about here is on the order of like uh, 200 milliseconds maximum, um, right? And so it's not a noticeable delay until you put it on a test stand and start measuring. Right. So. Then I brought all that, you know, uncertainty and I brought it into a simulation. And what you find predictably is that even if you try to light it at the right time, when you randomize that ignition delay, when you randomize that, mm-hmm. that variable to represent that, that actual uncertainty, you're not going to land. Like you, you're going to land once or twice when you get lucky and the rest of the time you're going to end up at five meters above the ground or, you know, hitting the ground. It's, it's really that close. Like, it's that tight of a problem. And so yeah. um, then I thought, what if we could do, like, some, like some level of throttling? Like, I don't want to have to put a servo that, like, impinges on the thrust or something like that. You know, that, that ends up being a heavy system. You, you get... Um, erosion right. on like deflection plates, you get um, all sorts of stuff. And, and it ends up meaning that you have to carry extra hardware. So the real trick of this project is that you don't necessarily have to control the thrust of the motor. You just have to control how much of it you spend vertically. Um, and so the idea with this new Scout rocket, which does seem to be working, like it works in the simulations and mm-hmm. for the one flight that we've had so far, it seems to work pretty well. It's pretty close. When you're coming yeah. down, yeah, well, yeah. When you're coming down, if you know exactly where the rocket should be, and you know the ignition delay time, and you know all of the factors of the flight at that at that moment, you can use like you can use all of those values to decide how hard you should pitch the rocket over using like the thrust vector control system. So the guidance system says. All right, I know I'm at 12 meters right now in the in the flight profile, and I should really be at 11 meters. So we're a meter high when we're coming down. And this all happens at like one specific point, um, mm-hmm. and so and then the guidance system says, "Okay, well, given this information, given where we are, how fast we're going, 
uh, the errors between where we are and where we should be. Uh, we should pitch the rocket over to like 20 degrees or 30 degrees or whatever. And that amount of pitch over, if we pitch over one way and then go back to sort of cancel out the slide that we accumulate on that, on that pitch maneuver, yep. Um, yep. if we go one way and back at that amplitude, we're going to bleed off just enough thrust so that we turn you know, what, what might be a pretty high landing into landing close to the ground. Um, and well, I've, I've only had one real flight, but so far it seems to have worked. <laughs> which is crazy. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm just trying to think of like the calculations involved that happen to ha- have to happen so fast for that to occur. It sounds a lot harder than actually just going up to me. Yeah. Oh, and it's, it's certainly harder than just going up. Um, Cause going up, you have the entire sky as, as I right. literally have the sky as the limit for, you know, it doesn't matter if you go to, uh, on this scale, we're going to like 30 meters, but it doesn't matter if I even go to like 50 meters or 15 or whatever, we're still going to get back down safely. But the landing thing is tough because, you know, any error there, if you can't bleed it off or if you can't deal with the error, uh, you're kind of in big trouble. <laughs> right. You only right. have a certain amount of thrust and, and it's not, and that will not stop until it's done and then it's done. Right, right, you know, and so burned, you're either gonna you're either gonna hit the ground and then hop back up, or hit the ground and tip over and you know land shark, or you're gonna burn <laughs> out too high, or it's it's all bad. It's like a very delicate problem. So that that brings it, I think, up to speed with where we're at. Um, and the only problem with the last flight was um, so the navigation computer tries to figure out how fast we're sliding along the ground. And of course, if you imagine like a long pole or if you imagine the Falcon 9 rocket, you know, sliding to the side when it when it comes down, if it touches down while it's sliding really fast, it's going to tip over. Um, mm-hmm. right. And so that's the problem that we had. The, uh, the navigation computer didn't think we were sliding that much. So the rocket felt like it had done its job well. And when it touched down, we were sliding a bunch and tipped over. Um, but we, we right. burned out about you know, maybe a half meter, foot and a half off the ground. Um, That's, so yeah, it's it an yeah. easy drop to tolerate, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, um, what kind of a, a tolerance are you looking for for that, that end game altitude, I guess, that, uh, for want of a better term? Um, so I am going to find that out. In between the first flight, which happened, and the second flight, which I'm hoping to do mid-December, maybe a little later, um, Mm-hmm. I ordered a ton of um, sort of flight representative tubes for the rocket. And so instead of damaging the rocket, I can damage these sort of sacrificial tubes that I bought. Sure. And what we're going to do is build a uh, like a landing mock-up, and I'm going to run a bunch of tests. One of them that I really want to try is uh, my buddy Charlie recommended I try it. He calls it a treadmill test. And so I turn a treadmill on at like 5 miles per hour, 15 miles per hour, 20 miles per hour, whatever. And I drop the rocket on the treadmill and then see if it'll tolerate that slide, if it'll actually tip over or, or not. Mm. Gotcha. So we can, yeah, yeah, yeah. can know exactly how fast we can, we can tolerate before tipping. And then I also want to try different surfaces too. Mm-hmm. Like there's a little bit of a bounce when the rocket touches down and it seems like it almost entirely comes from the grass. So mm-hmm. I don't really want to put spikes on it. Spikes feel like cheating and a little dangerous. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Slightly. <laughs> and I don't, I don't really want to land on concrete because if something goes wrong, grass is a lot more forgiving. Um, yep. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of where we're at. I, I need to do a little bit more characterization, but to answer your question, we can probably tolerate like a meter, maybe a meter and a half of a drop. Okay. Um, okay. Although, you know, of course, I'd, I'd like it to be less. Well, yeah, yeah, because you want to get that nice SpaceX, there it is, boom. So, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. We're going to uh, take a moment here to take a quick break on the Rocketry Show, and we'll come back with Joe Barnard, and we're talking with launching rockets without fins and landing them under rocket power <laughs> without a parachute, ideally. Mm-hmm. That is what we're talking about, and we'll be back to talk more with Joe right after this. 
North Coast Rocketry, one of the first high-power rocketry kit companies ever, takes advantage of over 30 years of high-power experience by a world-class rocketeer. You can look to North Coast Rocketry to expand your high-power rocket fleet. In addition to great kits, North Coast Rocketry also stocks lots of must-have items and accessories for every Rocketeer's workshop. Find out more about these kits and other great products today. Go to NorthCoastRocketry.com. And while you're there, don't forget to get their latest catalog, NorthCoastRocketry.com. Advanced rockets that are easy to build, fun to fly, and look great on display. It's time for Serious Rocketry. Serious Rocketry, since 1998, providing the Rocketeer with great kits, motors, supplies, and more. They have lots of products in their ever-growing web store with fast shipping, wide selection, and courteous service. You can also check out the amazing and popular Serious Rocketry kits that harken back to the days of fun-to-build detailed kits that are more than just three fins and a nose cone. Gene, what did you find? Oh, I found a great one. Um, You know how Estes has been doing a lot more back to basics and scale stuff and cool things uh, recently? Um, The Estes Skylab Saturn V, okay? Now, this... This is a little bit of a different Saturn V. It's not the the Apollo missions that went to the moon. It actually lofted the Skylab uh, space station up in one shot. You know, get the whole thing up there and deploy. It was basically a, a, a modified section. Um, and it's the so, it's the one time that the Saturn V got used for the other purpose it was built for. And that was to be a heavy all in lift, a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. heavy lift truck. <laughs> and it got used <laughs> once to do Skylab. Wow. And the last but, Saturn V launch ever. It was. It was. And out of like, they had the hardware and they just had to modify it um, a little bit, but um, they were going to go forward with it. The, thing, the rockets were already paid for, but the rest of the funding for the program, as we all know, sadly disappeared. But um, they were talking about doing like moon um, labs and you know, all kinds of cool stuff that we're starting to see coming back around 50 years later. But um, anyway, so Estes has the Skylab version. It's a one one hundred scale. It's got the vacuform wraps on it. It's um, it's got a three point you know, four inch diameter main section. It's about forty one inches tall. Um, the whole thing weighs about eighteen ounces when it's built. It's got the vacuform wraps, which I've learned how to do when I built my my Saturn V, um, and I think this will be a fun one to tackle. Um, Twenty nine millimeter motor mount has two 24-inch parachutes for the booster section and then a single 18-inch parachute for the top payload section. That would be your Skylab part. But it looks really, really cool. It's And it's, since it's a 29-millimeter motor mount, you can do a little bit of modification if you wanted to beef it up a little bit and put a little bit of a bigger motor. But it'll get 400 feet on an Estes Black Powder F-15, which would probably be a really dramatic launch, you know, the nice slow rise up. So that would be pretty cool. But if you wanted to go with composites, I'm sure you could do it. So you get all that. It's a, it's what they call a master level kit. They used to do skill level five, but they're calling it master level now. So it's going to take your time with this because it's got a ton of detail. It is, you show up on the range with this Saturn V and people are going to go, what the heck is that? And then you can just talk about Skylab all you want. It's a great rocket, a ton of detail. I'm really impressed with what they've been doing with this, the, the new Saturns and the new scale kits. Um, with that four inch diameter tube, the 29 millimeter motor mount, the three parachutes, the whole thing is um, on sale at Sirius for $84.99. So if you owe, if you like Saturns and you, this is the one to get because it, nobody else has it on the range, I'm sure everybody has their Saturn V Apollos, but right. not the Skylab one. Ooh. All righty. And Sirius Rocketry's website features real-time stock tracking, which lets you order with confidence from their online store. No having to call or write to see if something is really in stock. And when you're ready to fly, Sirius Rocketry has motors and hardware in stock from Estes to Aerotech High Power, as well as popular electronics from Jolly Logic and more. Be sure to ask them about their club specials while you're at it. Visit their websites today at siriusrocketry.biz and dot com. Serious Rocketry, for the Serious Rocketeer. Hey, all you rocket geeks out there. Do you like doing in-flight videos of your flights? And do you ever use those keychain cans and unfortunately sometimes only get videos of your thumb? Hey, this is Gene from the Rocketry Show, and that used to happen to me. I used to use those old keychain cams only to get nothing very good quality. But I found a solution to that, and it's Insane Rockets. It's an app that's available on the Google Play Store for Nexus 5X and higher. Now get this, it does 4K video. But not only that, it'll upload it automatically to the cloud and provide you real-time telemetry while tracking your rocket through Google Earth. 
It is amazing. Available on the Google Play Store, Insane Rockets app. It's crazy. No, wait. It's insane. The Rocketry Show would like to thank the following patrons for their support. Todd West, Matt Tudor, Les Rayburn, Stephen Spencer, Bill Cook, Jason Cook, Gary Rosenfield, Greg Ziegler, Toby Vanderbeek, Ken Blade, Eric Hamilton, John Beans, Scott Holla, Guy Wadsworth, Phil P., Tom Rump, Michael Moore, Stephen Ray, Amanda Ho, Steve Saner, Mark, Railbuttons.com, and Todd West. If you wish to show your support and become a patron of The Rocketry Show, just visit us at support.therocketryshow.com. Welcome back to the program. We're on with Joe Barnard of BPS.space. And um, yeah, we're talking all kinds of cool stuff. We're talking launching without fins, landing without parachutes under rocket power, <laughs> straight up on legs. <laughs> you know, like the Falcon 9. Anyway, crazy so, stuff. <laughs> welcome back, Joe. And we'll pick up where we left off last. Thanks. Time. You know, um, before yeah. the break, we were kind of going through the flight uh, processes and there's the the one thing that I found most interesting because I did get a chance to see that video which I thought was eminently beyond cool so congratulations on all the, <laughs> Thank everything you. Thank you know but um, a thing came to mind is like the system that okay so you're going up and the motor gets burnt out and you had you have to figure out a way to kick out a motor drop another one into that motor yeah. mount and and then light that thing off I mean how did that process work. <laughs> Oh, geez. Now, before you answer, because we'll have to explain this for folks who did not see any of these videos, um, explain uh, just kind of like the step by step and what it is that Jim is talking about and why that happens for us, Joe. Yeah, I, I totally forgot to mention this. Um, so this is crazy. And it was one of the hardest parts of this program. And I'll explain, I'll explain the problem first and then the solution. Here's oh. the problem. You can't really launch and land on one solid rocket motor. Once again, as we all know, like they, you light them, they burn, and there is no stopping them. Um, like you, <laughs> you can't. I mean, you could blow up the motor and it would stop burning, but we're not <laughs> doing that here. We're not um, doing that. <laughs> that doesn't. I don't think that's NAR approved. So um, what we do? Okay, so that's that's the first problem. You have to use two motors, and then the other problem is you don't really want to drop off like an entire stage to have a second motor in there. And right. you're carrying this hardware that, that, that changes the direction of the thrust. I call it a thrust vector control mount because it vectors the thrust, it holds the motor, it's a motor mount, um, and so it gimbals the motor. So you know, it's not too hard to do that on ascent, um, but how do you get a second motor into that mount when there's a motor already in the way? I have tried right. a bunch of <laughs> approaches for how to do this, um, one of the early ones that I did was just accepting asymmetric thrust. So I think, you know, maybe some of you have seen SpaceX is building their huge, crazy Starship rocket mm -hmm. down in Texas. And they've been doing these tests where they fly, you know, a portion of it. And there's a, uh, there's a mm -hmm. motor, there's a rocket engine under it that's slightly offset. So you can fly a rocket with offset thrust and you, you could put a launch and landing motor side by side. And in that way, you could you could technically do it that way, but the the control system for that gets a lot harder. Um, <laughs> it just gets okay, real servos and yeah. So yeah, yeah. And so instead, what I've opted to do is stack the motors one on top of the other. If you can imagine two, you know, these two cylindrical black powder Estes motors, one on top of the other, and they're in this spring loaded mount. And here's the other thing. Um, so. Some of you might be familiar with what's called the Krushnik effect. And yes. it's what happens when your motor, your motor's throat, like the nozzle of the motor, I think it's the nozzle exit technically, but the, the nozzle exit plane, if it is recessed into another tube, if you can think of this like, you know, if you have a low power rocket and you stick the motor uh, an inch recessed into the mm -hmm. airframe, you're actually going to get a lot less thrust mm -hmm. um, than you would normally. It's a really chaotic process that that makes this happen, um, and I don't know how to explain it well, but it you <laughs> you do lose thrust, and so you can't even like when you think about how to fire that second motor, 
you can't even use that second motor to hot stage the first one out. And for a while, I had attempted right. doing something like that. There's there's a video of a, um, I built a model of the SpaceX Falcon Heavy on the YouTube channel. And the uh, the center core of that booster used this sort of hot staging where we would just keep these two motors in the mount. And then when the second motor lit, it was pretty recessed into the airframe. And that doesn't work because you lose all this thrust. So basically, excuse me, what ends up having to happen is you have to get that second motor into the exact position that the first motor was in. You have to right. slide it down. So when you launch, there's this ascent motor on bottom, uh, on the bottom and, and a landing motor on the top. And they are both spring loaded. Like they're, it's almost like a, I don't even know how to, like a slingshot kind of. Like a There's a huge dispenser. rubber band or, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it's actually a set of springs now, but um, they're both under a bunch of spring load. And then when it's time to eject that um, ascent motor and time to get rid of it so that we can slot the, the landing motor into place, the whole mount actuates really far over in one direction. And there's this little pin on the inside of the rocket's airframe that sticks out just enough so that when we slam into the pin really hard, we we like kick the ascent motor out of its little seat. And <laughs> then we rotate back so that we get out of the way of the pin and the landing motor slots into place. And then there's a locking pin so that once the landing motor slots into place under all of that spring loading, on, on all of that spring loading, it can't go back up into the airframe. So when we fire it, it's it's like just as sturdy in the airframe as the ascent motor was. It is a crazy complicated, it's not even that complicated, but it's it's just a super delicate system to get right. right. Um, and it, that was what took most of the time for designing the physical side of it, at least. I, I can't imagine. It's um, because I saw the videos where I see this slow. Oh, there's an F-15 flying out of this airframe, and then wait, what? And then all of a sudden, it started when it's like its descent motor started. So my like, <laughs> God, that's like I, I'm just trying to think about how I would engineer something like that, and I just get a headache myself. But but that 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 must have been weird to get all that stuff right. Well, it's cool to watch. You know, the, another yeah. cool view to see is the one where he's got the camera inside the the airframe where you can see the mechanism working. So you see the motor is done and you see exactly what Joe describes and you see the uh, descent motor slap into place and it's ready to go. And <laughs> it's like, and you can see the uh, ascent motor <laughs> kind of tumbling off it through, the, through, the, through the cracks where you can see out towards the ground. You know, It's, it's really cool to watch. So the, the question that I have though is, did you have to flip PIDs on that when you're bringing it down as opposed to up or how oh. did... How did that work? For folks who aren't computer people here, let's go through a quick description with Joe uh, as to what a PID is. Yes. So, okay, that is a great question, Jim. And the answer is, in short, yes. So, okay. Um, <laughs> P, I, this took me a while to understand. Um, and we'll try to... We'll try to I'm still working a on it. <laughs> a PID is... Yeah. <laughs> a PID is, is what's referred to as a controller. Um, and it's not a physical thing. Uh, you can think of it as a set of just math equations. And they're not even that hard. It's like some division, some multiplication, and a little addition. Like that's, that's really mm -hmm. the, the heart of it. Um, and so the letters stand for proportional integral and derivative. Don't really worry about that right <laughs> now. Essentially what happens <laughs> is you give, you assign numbers to you assign it three numbers to this what's called a controller, and that's just changing coefficients in the uh, in in the equation, and it's just we're basically just changing how the equation spits out numbers, and so we give it a number it's as the input, and in this case we mm -hmm. give it something like the rocket's orientation, so where it's pointed, you know, zero degrees, five degrees, negative six degrees, whatever. And, and so when we feed a number into the input, it's going to give us an output. And that output is going to be where we point the motor in order to correct for that. So, so the right. controller takes the angle of the rocket or it takes the, the thing that we want to control, which would be the angle or the position or the velocity, and it spits out a value that we can then you know, write to our, our TVC mount so that we can control where the rocket's pointed. Um, and PIDs are like 
tuning these things, it, it, it's like an art form. I mean, it's <laughs> it's not it's easy. delicate. <laughs> it's very delicate. Yeah, I, I've delicate done a, is a better word. Yeah, I, I've done like two or three TVC flights, you know, on uh, on your board and my rocket, and it's like yeah, a, yeah. one little change, one little number, one little. Tenth point tenth of a number can change everything for your flight profile. It's 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 amazingly crazy. It's 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 precision, but it but but you're right. It's an art form in the fact that it's there's sort of a feel to it that you can't really put into an equation. I guess I, I don't know how to describe it. But. Yeah. No, no, no. You got it. You got it. Um, so when Jim asks, do you have to change the PIDs on the way down? I think what what he's referring to is when we eject that ascent motor, the like the physics of our rocket changes. The physics of how this thing flies through the air changes. We 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 have a significant mass loss. We have a, a change mm-hmm. in what's called our moment arm, which is the the distance sort of it's sort of where our center of mass is, right? Yep. Um, we have a difference in the weight of the vehicle. So so when that ascent motor gets ejected, we do change. The, the what's what are called the gains, sort of like the controller sensitivity, um, you know, how aggressive okay. the rocket tries to correct itself for mm-hmm. where the errors are. We do change that. We actually change it a couple of times during flight, depending on what phase we're in. So like when, you know, right at the end of the burn, you know, in the last 0.2 seconds or so, we don't really care where the rocket is pointed because we're about to drop. So instead of trying right. to point it in the right direction, all we try to do is just stop the rotation of the rocket so that when we when we burn out, once we lose control on the rocket, we can just drop. So there are all of these phases of flight where we switch to different, you know, gains or sensitivities. Okay. Um, and <laughs> the crazy, the craziest thing is like as we keep going here, it's it's easy to forget this whole thing happens in like 10 seconds. So <laughs> um you know, when you when you watch it in slow motion, I, I, I try to make it look really cool and I try to like hype it up and, you know, <laughs> boost the sound and all of the stuff that you do to try to make your rockets look cool. And, uh, <laughs> but the reality of the situation is that like, it, like it's just such an absolutely chaotic event. <laughs> and it's all over in like 10 seconds. Yes. Yeah, less. <laughs> yeah. And and, mm-hmm. and that's the trick with anything when you're, trying to test stuff with computers and, and have things happen is that, you know, as Joe said, a lot happens in a very short period of time. And, uh, which makes for analysis to be fun. It's, it's amazing. Like when you're trying to go through and see, kind of dissect what happened or didn't happen on a flight and you look over your logs, the flight lasts 10 seconds, but it could take you a couple of weeks to, Go moment for by moment to moment by moment to Especially see what's Especially like, you know, on your um on your system where you get all your data. Like I've seen this, I've seen some of your videos, Joe, where you've got like tons of data in 17 different screens in a window. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it's like, okay. And that's and you've got the entire flight profile thing in there. That could take I mean, <laughs> how how long do you sit and parse data through after a flight? My God. It is insane. And it's really easy <laughs> to like. I mean, this is this is like a side effect of doing things on YouTube. You know, never look at the YouTube comments. Everyone's got something to say, and right, <laughs> a lot of the times, no one actually knows what they're talking about, including my me. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's like I always get this comment that's like, "Why don't you fly multiple times in a day, or why don't you, you know, do X, Y, Z, or how come you don't just fly day after day, and then one time you'll get <laughs> it right?" And the 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 whole idea with like collecting all this data and going. <laughs> just just a little too crazy with the complexity on these rockets is I just I want to build larger control systems and I want to build larger rockets and I want to do things that are really advanced and um, if I can if I can prove that level of reliability you know the, the level of reliability mm-hmm. you need to build something that's really high risk if I can prove that at the model scale um, I think that helps me me move forward and so part of it is like. I think there's a really good chance that we stick the landing on the second flight and it'll all be because, you know, I've collected a tremendous amount of data. I know exactly what happened on every part of the computer. And so we can just finish dialing in the system at that point. And if I had loaded another motor and flown again, um, especially given what I know about the error now, the same error would have just happened. Right. 
Yeah, they just waste mm-hmm. a motor and yeah. time. And so it usually, yeah, and so it usually like takes, you know, a few weeks to parse through all that stuff and really decide, okay, what needs to be changed? Where, do, how do we need to uh, approach the second attempt at this? All that kind of stuff. Yes. That's just exactly. incredible. Which, and I mean, even even the, you're getting the details down to even the landing legs coming down. So <laughs> is that um, how, is that is how do you how do you like judge when that is? Is it from like um, an accelerometer or you know, like when do you drop the yeah. legs? I mean, so it's actually I had I had trouble deciding exactly where to do these things. There are two events on the way down. Um, uh, so so at Apogee. The rocket flips out these fins on top, and it turns into sort of an upside down regular model rocket. So the fins right. are passive; they're, they're passive stability on the way down. So that uh, even though the you know we don't have a really smooth um, sort of nose cone, we essentially have a passively stable rocket that falls in the same orientation that it descends. And so that's how we know we're going to be able to light that ascent motor in the right orientation. It's mm-hmm. the same as SpaceX having grid fins on their rocket. They want to make sure they're pointed in the right direction. Sure. Among other things, they can you know guide the whole thing. But um, so so we pop these fins out, and then before we land, I actually put the fins into the vehicle again. There's a little servo that controls it, and uh, that happens. I decided to to make that happen. I think either below six meters per second or four meters per second okay. of vertical speed. Gotcha. And then the landing legs were based on altitude, not speed, because I felt like that was a little bit more reliable for the for what the legs are supposed to do. So the legs are okay. below six meters above the ground, I think, um, and they take a little longer to actually fold out because the way we right. do it is uh, we we burn that a little piece of nichrome or like resistance wire, and that cuts a rubber band. Mm-hmm. So that takes about a quarter second and so we end up deploying legs probably about four meters above the ground that's it's it's cool <laughs> so it's it, yeah it's really cool and if anybody hasn't seen any of these videos um go to joe's youtube channel it's bps.space is that correct yeah, yeah yeah and we'll put a link to that in our show notes as well on the on the website and uh for you to check that out so Keep that in mind. Yeah, the as well. good quality yeah, videos, thanks. and you want drama and action. I mean, these <laughs> these are it. So you get inside shots, outside shots, you know, far shots, near <laughs> shots. It's, it's all good. <laughs> yes. Thanks a bunch. Yeah, I appreciate it. Well, I've spent a few hours going through some of those, just like, how does he do this? You know. <laughs> I've I've been having fun watching. You know, with where you are when when you have another launch coming up, and and uh, so yeah, the videos of the flights are very interesting, but. At the same time, watching uh, your videos of you dissecting what happened, as you explained, and uh, and, the, and those videos go on for a while. So that's the amount of detail you get out of Joe when you look at these, <laughs> and, and you learn a lot. You know, I kind of i I kind of try to structure them. Like I am, I, I'm well aware that like most people aren't going to be interested in the data breakdown and all that stuff. So I try to I try to put all of the fun launch footage up front. So if you just want to see that, like right. click and that's it. And then you can sort of click away, you know, whenever your interest is no longer there. But then us geeks, we like to. It's, oh, it's, yeah. it's fun to just <laughs> to see this, to watch the wheels turn, you know, Joe Barnard's wheels turning. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I'm taking the signal computer and using it in my uh, with my rocketry team, my high school kids, because they're all into SpaceX oh, awesome. and that's and that's what they want to do. So I've actually I've got some kids that are working on some thrust vectoring uh, rockets right now. As a matter of fact, we're going to use your your system as the heart of this test, and we're just going to we're having some fun with it. So it's it's like nailing down the PID numbers and, you know, because you have to go through a process where you take the airframe and you hang it from strings and you, you rotate it and you do these counts to get the numbers and then you add the mass and all this other stuff in. So you have to do all this stuff before you even fly a thrust vectored rocket just yeah. to, to make sure that you're going to be as safe as possible. And I and my kids have to because, um, you know, I'm responsible for them. So, <laughs> you know, I don't want them to burn <laughs> themselves or anything, have anything bad happen to them. <laughs> But well, and the other thing too is if if you ever you know if you ever smash another computer or whatever, I'll send you another one. Um, I don't know what happened that the first one that you had had an ejection charge go off into it, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that so was. I, I remember you sent it back, and I spent like two or three days looking at it. I have no idea what happened, but um, yeah, if, if if another one burns out, I'll I'll send you a replacement. 
Uh, no, well, I appreciate that, but um, you know, we're, uh, we're we're we're, man- we're managing along, and we le- we all learn from our mistakes, right? So I've learned a yeah. lot since I've been just tinkering with this. And normally, I'm a big rocket, get it up in the air, high power guy, you know, just like you know, a bowling ball in the air kind of guy. But in this case, though, it's nice because it's a total departure because you actually have to sit down and think through the entire flight before you put a motor in that thing so you know what's going on you yeah. expect to know what's happening you know and you have to be safe with this stuff i mean it's basically you're sending a rocket that is inherently unstable up and you're relying on that computer to do what it needs to do to make it safe and if you don't put the right numbers in you're not going to get a good flight i mean that's all there is to it so but it's it's, yep. it's a lot of fun yep. playing with the details um you know it's not going to be something that i do all the time but it's a really good thing to teach kids about and myself about you know the basics of how how a rocket actually flies going up, you know the down part. I I, I can't even imagine at this point, but um, maybe <laughs> maybe I'll see how I get with the up part, though, and then we'll get to the down part. But but it's it's a great tool. So thank you for like doing all the stuff that you've done because I'm actually taking that and using it to teach the next generation or at least get them inspired. So that's you know, awesome. Just so you know, yeah, so. yeah, that's really cool. I'm glad it's working out for them. Teaching the next and, Joe. Well, I, you know, who knows? Because like there's with SpaceX and everything, that's the big hook for the kids these days because they're, they're not so much on Artemis because they have never seen a moon landing. So I don't know if they quite right, appreciate right. how cool that's going to be, but they certainly are into SpaceX reusability, sustainability. The landings are always cool to watch, you know, that kind of stuff. So, and I think it's yeah. great. I think, I think we're in a second space race at this point. I do too. Yeah, I do too. I think it's, um, I mean, like, I don't know. I, there's, there's some stuff to be said about like astronomy and Starlink, but but for for what mm-hmm. it's worth, SpaceX has done an incredible amount for for getting people interested in space again. It's, it's absolutely yeah. it's something that you know for for all of the good that that NASA is, it's still hard for them to get everyone excited like like SpaceX does. So I think you know for what it's worth, they they've done a great job with that. Oh, I predict as soon as that first uh, foot gets back on the moon, that's going to send a little surge of excitement through the kids. I know it will be. You know, they just... Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. I, I, I know it. You feel so it? that makes moment. me happy. <laughs> All this stuff is exciting, right? I mean, this, we, we wouldn't do it if it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. That's true. That's true. So as we wind down here on a, on a, on a different note here, I noticed you've been making changes to your, your launch pad. Um, now... Now, Joe's launch pad is kind of cool, and, and you're kind of going about doing things the way you know I've always uh, imagined, but I just couldn't find a re- I couldn't find a a problem to solve by having you know um, umbilical cords disconnect from my rocket. <laughs> but you, but you practically have that going on. So tell so tell folks a little bit about what you've got going on with your launch pads. The launch pad has been through a lot of iterations. Um, so I've gone through a few phases of it. Um, initially, I had um, a bunch of tower clamps on the top, um, kind of like you see on the Falcon 9 with, with the strong mm-hmm. back. You know, it has those arms that grip around the second stage and then they let go before launch. I used to have some of those. Um, I used to have a little umbilical arm that, that would talk to the flight computer and tell the flight computer like, hey, we're about to launch, get ready. Um, you know, something like that. And then uh, as, especially with, you know, the, the kit, the one that you have, Jim, the, especially with mm-hmm. the kit, you can't sell the launch pad with the kit. And so you have to make the flight computer work on its own. And what right. I realized in doing that too, is that it's just a lot easier to keep the launch pad and the rocket totally separate at this scale, right? So like mm-hmm. the launch pad lights the motor. So it's, so you can keep that dead simple. You don't have to do any fancy code and you can stay... Uh, NAR compliant by having right. the, you know, like a dead man switch or or a way to passively abort the flight by not pressing a button or whatever. Um, and you can you can have su- super simple code so so that can work. Um, and then uh, the rocket will just detect the launch. And because of how fast these little, you know, embedded controllers run, these little flight computers, they run so fast that it effectively it just doesn't matter that it takes ten milliseconds for it to figure out. Oh, I'm in the air now, because um, <laughs> you know okay. ten milliseconds off the launch pad is what like maximum a centimeter or something. Right. Um, so yeah, the the launch pad right now the only thing that it does is it lights the motor, 
Um, so again, we have that separate control. You know, it doesn't, no motors are lit until we're really ready to go. And the flight computer has no ability to do that, um, except for the landing motor, of course. But right. then the, uh, the other thing it does is it, there are some launch clamps. So, you know, contrary to a, a traditional passively stable model rocket, we don't have a launch rail or a launch rod. Um, we just have a rocket that's sitting on a little table. Um, and then it's clamped down with these little, I mean, they're pretty much hold down arms. They, they sort of right. strap down onto the rocket like you would a piece of wood on a, on a workbench with a vice grip or something. Um, and so when it's time to go, those clamps release, they, they open up and the rocket has the ability to lift off. And so it serves the same function where if there's a big gust of wind, the rocket isn't going to blow over or anything. Um, and then they know exactly when to release the rocket so that when it's time to go, they can get out of the way. And did you change the delay on the when the hold down clamps like release? Um, because I know that you were doing a little bit of that earlier where you held it down for a little yeah. bit before you let, let go. So I have... <laughs> <laughs> I have this obsession with low thrust to weight ratio rockets, and it has <laughs> bit me in the buttocks so many times. So I'll tell you about that. Um, last, not this past summer, but the one before, so summer of 2019, um, Gary from Aerotech worked with me to create these. I mean, he did all, like all of the work, but... Um, <laughs> Aerotech worked to create these ultra long burning motors. Um, there's the G8, yes. the G11, the G12, and the H13. Um, and the G8 is the exception, but the uh, G11, 12, and H13 have these huge thrust spikes at the beginning of the burn. And all of the realism that you can get with thrust vector control is negated when you just, just go careening off the launch pad like <laughs> a traditional model rocket. And my goal was, you know, what if we held the rocket on the pad with these launch clamps for, for the duration of that thrust spike and then let it go and had it slowly rise off the pad? And there are a couple of right. videos on the channel that you can see where we do have that really slow rise. The problem, <laughs> the problem is that with these motors, and you, you just, you can't blame Aerotech, you can't blame anyone. It's very hard to get, you know, space shuttle booster level accuracy on how much thrust you're going to get. <laughs> So, right. um, and especially with end, bo end burners in a vastly different climate, you know, they're, they're testing them in a super dry climate up, out in Utah and mm -hmm. I'm in a super humid climate down in Nashville. So, so the, the properties of the burn change, all of that is to say, I have had several flights. One of them is really notable, but se several flights that, uh, you know, we hold the rocket down on the pad with the clamps. There's a, about a 1.25 second delay. So the motor is just burning you know, through the flame trench. And right. uh, when it lifts off, it lifts off super slowly. And so I've had two or three flights where it has not had enough thrust. We sort of rise up off the pad and then we fall down, hit the ground. And then like for, ah. you know, the rest of the 15 second <laughs> burn, we're, we're just going at like, <laughs> you know, maybe maximum seven miles per hour, just scooting <laughs> along the ground. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> and those are fun to watch. And they're, you know, the best, they're only fun too because, you know, it's just, it's not dangerous. You can easily get out of the way if it's coming towards you. I had this one, I had this one really crazy flight uh, in summer of 2019 where it, it, the rocket lifted off and I just got super lucky. We hit a total equilibrium and for about 15 seconds, it hovered. It hovered, uh, I remember and that. the maximum <laughs> altitude. Yeah, it, it hovered, it slid to the right and then... Um, over the course of 15 seconds, we rose maybe about two <laughs> meters maximum and then dropped back into the grass. It was amazing. And it was really stable, too. I, I remember that video. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> you seem to have fun with it. It certainly <laughs> wasn't intentional, but it was fun. Yeah, so I've, I've, uh, I've stopped doing the uh, hold down for the thrust spike stuff. And I've, okay. just, I've just made my peace with, you know, if I want to do low thrust to weight ratio, don't go lower than like 1.1. 1. 1. <laughs> okay. Got it. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, I was wondering fun. about that because like, uh, like CG had said, the pads have changed a lot. So, but another question for you is, okay, so let's say you nail your landing, you know, which I expect sure. it to do, you know, boom. What's, what's next for BPS <laughs> Space and Joe Barnard? What is next? Okay. 
I am glad you asked. I uh, am real. I have said this for like a year and a half now, but I I really want to scale up. And what's next for me? I, I don't know when I'm going to land it, but I think mm-hmm. regardless of that, I'm going to do my L3 in I think February. That's the current plan, at least. Um, okay. Going to do the L3. Then there's a lot of work to do on that. And then yep. I think I just start. I want to start going pretty high. Um, and so we'll see what that looks like. Um, I'm working with a couple people. I have a few flight computers that are slated to just get like fly along as payloads on mm-hmm. um, really high altitude flights. Um, and like maybe a couple of space shots, although it's it's rare that those come back in one piece. So we'll see. Um, right. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I'd like to start going pretty high and um, I'd like to start building larger vehicles that are a little higher risk. Um, and gotcha. so again, I, I think I said it in the, um, in the, in the video, the most recent video, you can go watch it if, I mean, you guys have both seen it, but um, mm-hmm. you know, the goal with um, testing so aggressively on this program and, and trying as hard as I can to get it right on the first try um, isn't necessarily that it's really important um, or that, you know, you really need to do it for safety at this scale, but it's that, um, with the intention to scale up, I have to prove that I can get things right out of the gate. Because when you light an right. M motor with some type of guidance, you, you <laughs> have to know that it works. Like, <laughs> yeah, there's yes. no excuse for, for that not working. Right. Um, yeah. So that's that's the plan. I think I think we're going to start scaling up soon. Cool. Like your style, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well. It- We were very happy to have you on here and finally, you know, to sit down and just talk in some detail about what you've got going on. And it kind of worked out that it it ended up being now versus a couple of years ago because um, it's more of a a, more of a story arc to this whole thing now (laughs) than back then. So which is really cool. Yeah, I know Dan has a bunch of audio or something. Yes. uh, From a long time ago. Um, but anyway, yeah, if you guys ever want to chat again or, or anything like that, just let me know. I'm, I'm happy to come hang out. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks Thanks for coming on. For, yeah, thanks. You know. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having me. Stick around. There's more from the Rocketry Show to come right after this. Lock Precision Rocketry manufactures a full line of high-quality precision fit components to meet your building, repairing, and customizing needs. Lock Precision believes in making rocket kits as light as possible while maintaining the strength required to fly with commercially available motors. Lock Precision offers a wide range of rocket kits from the 1-inch diameter Lock 1 series to high-power rockets reaching 7.6 inches in diameter. When you visit LockPrecision.com, be sure to check out their performance series kits featuring such designs as the Black Brand 10, the Caliper ISP, and the 3.1 inch diameter Iris Rocket. All of Lock Precision's performance kits comes with everything you need, including pre-slotted airframes, high-grade precision cut plywood fins and components, as well as rift-stop nylon parachutes, rugged shock cords, polypropylene nose cone, and instructions. The name Lock Precision has been synonymous with mid and high-power rocketry for over 30 years. Check out LockPrecision.com to find out why. LockPrecision.com Fly higher, fly lock. It's time for eRockets. eRockets.biz is your home for unique model rocket kits, as well as the world's largest selection of rocket parts from Semrock. They've been in business since 2009. eRockets.biz has a wide selection of your favorite kits, as well as their own versions of popular out of production models many of you have come to enjoy over the years. Jesse, what did you find? So, I recently spoke about some uh, 1.6 diameter rockets. Uh, I found another one that I want to talk mm-hmm. to you guys about. Uh, this one is actually made from MadCow and it's available on eRockets.biz. And this one here is a 1.6 diameter, um, minimum diameter, fiberglass Go Devil. The price of this rocket is amazing for for the amount of stuff that comes with it. Uh, this particular rocket, um, you know, comes with the filament round uh, five and one ogave black nose cone, and it also has all mm-hmm. red components. And um, it doesn't have red fins, but the body, the body frame, the payload, the switch band. And uh, the coupler are all red. So, I mean, if you can fendangle some stuff, you may not even have to paint the body. Just run a clear over it, maybe, and do the same with the nose cone. Um, it does have a. a 
G10 fiberglass fins. Um, this one actually does come with a fin alignment guide. So where it's minimum diameter that I could see where that's helpful, you know, because you can keep your stuff straight. It's because you don't really have any other bonding service to do short of doing the inside and the fillets on the outside. Right. And of course, you know, right. you could always do a tip to tip after the fact or just whatever you'd like to do. Um, this rocket is made to fly on anything from a G to a J motor, which is really cool. Um, it's just over a pound. So it's still lightweight. Um, this thing does come with that fiberglass um, nose cone, which you'll be able to probably, you know, go past mock if you need to. Um, this is over 50 inches tall, which is really nice. Guys, this rocket is available for under 100 bucks, and it's available right now on eRocket.biz. Wow. All right. There are also plenty of other rocketry items to choose from, such as educational rocket kits and supplies, air rockets, water rockets, and so much more. eRockets.biz certainly has enough kits and supplies to keep you busy in your workshop for a long time to come. Need parts for your own custom builds? Not a problem. eRockets.biz also supplies the Semrock line of airframes, nose cones, centering rings, motor mounts, and so much more. eRockets has more rocket parts available than anyone else on Earth. Earth. Check out erockets.biz to learn more. erockets.biz. If rocketry scares you, buy a train set. Going up in five, four, three, two, one, lift off. From Little Beth Media, a new podcast on model rocketry with build techniques, model rocket history, interviews with industry insiders, stuff for beginners and longtime model rocketeers. Everything from low to mid-power. The Model Rocket Show with me, the Rocket Noob, at themodelrocketshow.com or anywhere you download podcasts. The Rocketry Show would like to thank the following patrons for their support. Timothy Mock, Conway Stevens, Jeff Curtis, Phil Bridges, Scott Masters, Roy Tyson, Rob Hoagie, R. Smith, Gary Dow, Jay Palman, Don J, G. Schmierden, M. Erisman, Pierre Marlou, Jeff Curtis, Brian Lapato. Philip Calvin, Jay Bryan, Casey Anderson, Terry Dancer, Mark Essenwine, Jim Wilson, Jason O'Scally, and Scott Masters. If you wish to show your support and become a patron of The Rocketry Show, just visit us at support.therocketryshow.com. Back to the Rocketry Show at therocketryshow.com and a very fun visit with Joe Barnard. Joe Barnard. Yeah. yeah. It was so sad that you weren't around for that one, Jesse, but uh, you'll hear it. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Indeed. Well, you know, it's like we've been following him for so long and it's just mm -hmm. nice to catch up like an old friend, you know? And, and Yeah, and it's been a, one of those cases for almost, what, a year, year and a half or so. We're gonna, we were just kind of going, yeah, we got to get Joe on the show and talk to him. Yeah, yeah, we're going to do that. And then five other <laughs> yeah. things come up. and Oh, yeah, we yep. got to get Joe on the show. Yeah, we got to do that. Yeah. Yeah, we great. didn't do that last time. We, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Five other things go by. So this point, you know, <laughs> I was like, gonna, we're going to do it. Even though a couple things came up and we had to cancel. But I was like, okay, well, no, we're going to do this in a couple days here. <laughs> so <laughs> well, we great. got it. Got hey. him nailed down and on the show. So we'll have him back on again. He's a lot of fun. So, um... What do we have here on the uh, things going on here from you guys? What's new before we hit the mailbag? What you got, Jess? So, uh, Andrew, Kleinhands, right, on episode 101, just a few episodes ago, mm -hmm. was talking about his uh, Mac Performance Scorpion. Mm -hmm. So, he sends a couple emails to us, and I think you guys were on those email chains, and I was watching the videos that he sent, and I talked myself into one. <laughs> um, I had bought a Mac Performance VTS6 probably two years ago, and it's still in the box. I've never opened it. Okay. So mm -hmm. what I did was uh, I really wanted the Scorpion after looking at it and looking at his um, that is on the website for Mac Performance. Um, you'll see Andrew holding his model on there. And uh, I believe his had a tail cone, but the model doesn't actually come with one. But I, I, I went ahead and took the plunge, and I bought a 4-inch diameter Mac Performance Scorpion. Um, I nice. opted to get the 75 millimeter motor tube just so I could fly, you know, some fat L's in there. And then, uh, <clears throat> I got the, uh, Von Karman nose cone from, uh, mm -hmm. uh, wild man rocketry. So they do have a four in one. Oh, gave, um, nose cone made of plastic that you can get for these rockets. But you know, if you're putting a 75 millimeter, you know, engine and motor in there, you might want to go ahead and just get a, you know, fiberglass nose cone in case you hit, you know, 
pass mock or whatever. So I went ahead and paid the upgrade and, and got that. Um, the cool. way that he packages these things is probably some of the best that I've seen. And uh, Mike over at, uh, you know, Mac Performance basically sent you the eBay with all the hardware already assembled and just tightened by hand so that nothing was just kind of floating around in a little baggie or something like that you might potentially lose. Um, it, and hmm. the sled that he had was already on there. And I did an unboxing video. I don't know if I showed you guys. Maybe we can share that with with folks. But, um, you know, that kind of seems to be the thing on some of these uh, Facebook groups is do an unboxing of some mm -hmm. of the new toys that you get over the holidays. So this, since I bought this toy for myself, I went ahead and did an unboxing. And, uh, you know, I got a few other people, you know, to get a few other, you know, Mac Performance Rockets. And I, I really... I'm really excited to build this thing. I have not done it yet, but I mean, it's got, you know, the Kevlar lead for the shock, the, you know, for the recovery harnesses and it, it doesn't mm -hmm. come with recovery. I mean, you have to buy that, but they do sell different items for recovery that you have. Um, I already have existing setups for four inch diameter rockets that would be fine for this. So I just opted to use my own, which is great. Um, that, that nose cone, uh, it's, it's, five in one so it's actually bigger than their plastic ones and you nice. get the weight on the front so if you you know 75 millimeter in the back you have that weight to make up the difference in the front um mm -hmm. there's already sims that he has on the website that you can download for this that'll work in open rocket or rock sim uh, it's just uh, fantastic stuff I, i'm very Are you excited gonna put a to tracker bay in the nose cone um, yeah, but, uh, the way that I have my electronics sled set up, uh, I do have my little tracker housed on the electronics bay. And I think okay. we talked about that before I use that, um, mm -hmm. uh, Apogee simple GPS tracker. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. that, that one has a built-in antenna and that doesn't stick out or anything. And as long as you don't have that next to your batteries, uh, in most cases, you'll be fine. Um, it's worked with every other launch I've did, so I'll probably still continue to do that. But yes, there's... It, um, you can take the uh, nose cone tip. Uh, it's just the regular, um, I think it's a number 10, but it might be a quarter. I'll have to look again. But either way, you can get a you know a rod if you want to and then you know set up things that way mm -hmm. if you'd prefer yep. to do that. So yeah, it's, Lots of it's, options. it's great. Mm -hmm. Cool, yeah. you sound excited about it. All right, and uh, what else do you have there, Jesse? Oh, geez. So, um, you know, I went crazy around Christmas time for myself. Um, I got to, you know, thank goodness because of, uh, COVID and as busy as we've been, um, my work basically entails online payments. Mm -hmm. So things that you buy online, things like that, um, we're busy all the time, you know, especially during, you know, the uh, pandemic, everybody's buying stuff online from groceries to toys, you know, rocket toys, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, to, you know, just whatever. So I have been busy. So I got a good bonus this year and I treated myself. I bought a Mach 1, four inch diameter area 51, as well as some nice. 38 millimeter um, basically, uh, BT 60, um, kits as well. So I got an alien interceptor and, a, a uh, an area 51 in BT 60 size. And since they come with the couplers, the longer couplers, um, I added a, uh, badass rocketry, um, BT 60 electronics kit for that mm -hmm. electronics yeah. base so that, you know, I can put my uh, RC two on there. And uh, I got a few other toys too. Uh, I got a, went ahead and got a five and a half inch uh, Goblin from Locke. And I have a lot of toys. I'm, I'm hoping to build some of these things for NSL, which is going to be tentatively here at the end of May around Memorial Day. And um, there is a Facebook page open for that, guys. So you Colorado natives or those of you thinking about traveling, if you know we're able to this year, take a look at that Facebook page and get the detail, details on that. And yeah, but you, you guys want to know what I'm excited for this weekend? What are you excited virtual, for this weekend? <laughs> virtual Narcon. Yes. Yes. Yep. So that's this weekend. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, this coming weekend. So depending on when the show airs, you may, you know, <laughs> yeah. well, get to be, listen it'll to be, this between. <laughs> the show will be out during virtual Narcon. So there you go. So in case yeah. you, when you hear it, depending, depending, on when you, depend, depending on when you hear it, you'll either be reminded of it or you'll hear it after <laughs> you've done the virtual Narcon. So. Yep. So and uh, that's what's going on in my camp. Well, you've oh, got um, one other thing too going yeah, on that will uh, that's going to be. We'll have a video for the patrons on this one. But uh, tell yeah, us. so so yeah. check this out. Um, when I was painting my level three, I wasn't going to paint it initially because I really liked the way that the fiberglass and the carbon fiber looked on it. But yeah. after talking to some other people and you know the delays that I've had to deal with, I, I wound up deciding to go ahead and paint it. So I go outside and I start painting it. You know, the booster can falls on the ground. <laughs> Yeah. After I painted it, primered it, I had to sand it all down and redo that crap again. Um, I didn't tape it off right, so I got a lot of bleed through, so I had to strip that all down and sand it again. Yeah. Uh, there's so many little things that I had to do. And, you know, waiting on weather in Colorado to find a nice 40-degree day, 
yeah, 40 degree day. Um, I decided to go ahead and just uh, finish the project that I had talked to you guys about before. And I went ahead and set up the rest of my indoor paint booth. And uh, I took a small video and I sent it to these guys so they can see. So I'll try to take a better video just so you can post CG. But um, basically it's a thick plastic draped from the walls which is a thicker plastic than what you would put like on a carpet if you were painting a living room or something like that. Um, this is the uh, 0 0.005 ply. So it's, it's almost as thick as Mylar sheeting. It's really, really nice. Um, I have a hanger um, set up that uh, I bought from Ikea. So if you guys are around in Ikea, they make these things where you can hang like temporary drapes and stuff. And I use that to yeah. hang this plastic. It works perfect. Mm. Um, I put two of those on there and it allows me to actually push the curtains out of the way so that I have more floor space. But when I close it up, I'm able to vent all the air out of my main window. And then like I was saying on that previous episode, uh, I have a blower motor that I need to get installed. And uh, I got a contractor um, friend of ours that's going to come and help us uh, set up another dryer type vent so it'll always be able to extract the air. That way you don't have any fumes in whatsoever. Nice. But uh, even, even with the setup I have in the window, guys, it vents so much air out that I have to actually put on like my little floor fan that you use to dry like a wet carpet or something. I have that mm. on the other side of the room so it actually blow air into the basement so that... You know, because this, this fan is sucking more air out than I have in the basement. It's kind of funny. So, so your plastic walls are caving in on you on the side. Making exactly. down there, aren't you? <laughs> uh-huh. But I'm looking forward to, you know, possibly getting a CNC router in here and a couple other things and maybe a laser cutter. And then I'll be able to still use that vent system, you know, for the output for those, mm -hmm. those things as well to kind of do some other side projects with. And uh, this is something that was necessary. Man, I, I got to tell you, after I finished that, got my level three booster painted in two days. Nice. So nice. Yeah. Real nice. Yeah. So I hope to have pictures of that for you all soon. Cause like I said, I think I have the most public secret as far as level three goes <laughs> at, at anybody. And I think people are tired of hearing about it. So next time I talk about it, I'll have pictures and hopefully a launch behind it. How's that? Sounds good. Sounds like a plan. So that's sounds like a wiener that's to happening me. in Jesse world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so all thanks for putting up with me, everybody. So <laughs> good stuff. Good fun. Good stuff. You have anything, Jim? Well, um, a couple little things, but it's mostly regarding my team. Okay. Um, I've got one student that is doing an independent science project. He's got, he built five rockets. They're all um, like BT-80 size tubes mm -hmm. um, with some plywood fins. And he had to do an independent science project with five different fin shapes to see which would be the most efficient design. Ooh, that so, sounds pretty cool. He went trapezoidal, ellipsoidal, like rectilinear, blah, blah, blah. And he's got, so the rockets are all the same. They're all within the same weights and they're not painted. So they're all about the same except for the fence. And okay. he wanted to use black powder, um, what was it, E12s, which great. Okay. Because you get a long burn out of them and he, that way he could like watch the, uh, the slower flight and then he'd be able to get some like videos and stuff for that. So we went out to the uh, Northern Ohio Tripoli launch site. Thanks guys uh, for helping me set that up. And he and I just went out and we launched 15 rockets in the course of a Saturday. Yeah. Just <laughs> Getting it up there, getting the data, um, you know, then coming back down, loading it up and doing it again. So we did three flights for each one of those five rockets to get some data. So that was actually a lot of fun because it was just like, I was just, we we're just hanging out and he was getting all his data and I didn't have to write down anything. I just had to make sure he was safe. And I, and I, and I had a lot of fun. We just, that's all we did. We launched 15 rockets. <laughs> Nice. In the course of a day. It was a lot of fun. And hopefully this Saturday, I'm going to be taking my TARC team out to the same place to do some testing because they've got their rockets ready to go, but we just haven't had a chance to go out and do some testing. So so thanks again to uh, Northern Ohio Tripoli and Skybusters for, um, you know, and the landowner, Mr. Bourne, so that we can go out to that farm field and actually just launch stuff. And it's all low power, so we don't need to worry about any kind of flight waivers right, or anything. Right, right. So, and that way the guys are not going to lose their rockets and they can get some good flight times in. So that's that's what I've been up to. It's mostly been trying to corral the cats to get some action going <laughs> with their stuff. So, but it's been a lot of fun for me though. It's it's good to just like get together with them and see them masking up and wearing gloves and all that. But it's still it's still right. rocketry. So, so yes. that makes me happy. All right, very cool, cool stuff. And uh, so now we're going to jump over to the mailbag here, and we've got a couple of uh, comments from listeners of the show. And uh, the first one here is from uh, uh, John here. And uh, he's got, this is like continuing on stuff from episode 101, tracker suggestions. So he's got a couple of uh, tracking uh, suggestions to find your rockets after they land. So mm -hmm. let's listen to his comment here. 
Hi guys, uh, this is John Sicker, old time Tripoli and NAR member, Tripoli 1017, NAR 49422. Hey, I really enjoy your show. Been enjoying it since the beginning. Every episode seems to even be getting better. Really like the last episode 101 about the uh, shear pins and trackers. Been using trackers and shear pins for a long, long time. One thing I might suggest uh, for trackers for your ham audience, which I'm one, uh, KC2HRR is my call sign, is the uh, Big Red B. They've been making excellent trackers for a long time. I think they also make now a 900 megahertz non-ham as well, but they have an excellent tracker, very good for long range, really nice tracker. Um, basically, you need a Yagi antenna and a standard receiver for it, but um, really good. Um, other suggestion is um, I've been involved as kind of a sideline. I used to do uh, a lot of electronics for uh, some projects and um, was involved in some big projects um, back uh, in uh, 1992 at the Black Rock Desert. Um, we did a, um, or I helped just on the sidelines uh, with some electronics that was flown in downright ignorant, which was one of the monster scale rockets that were flown. It was flown with a uh -huh. P with five L's and eight Ks wow. all at the same time. Amazing <laughs> wow. cluster. Great video. Amazing amount of work those guys did on it. You might want to think about interviewing Chuck Sackett, who now lives in Florida. He's uh, the main guy that built that rocket in Project 486 and a few other big burns. He also used to sell some really interesting kits. Might want to look him up. Really nice guy. Uh, did some cool projects and uh, was happy to be a little tiny part of that downright ignorant project. Thanks, guys. Keep up the good work. Thank you for your comment there, uh, John. You know, John, I do have the, the uh, Big Red B does make a 900 megahertz tracker. I've got mm -hmm. one. Um, that was the very first tracker that I got. And it was it was kind of cool because you get this little receiver box and you get GPS coordinates delivered right to your hand. And then you take that and take those GPS and plug it into your phone or Google Maps or whatever. Um, <clears throat> unless, of course, you happen to know the GPS coordinates offhand. But um, it's a neat little system. The 900 megahertz does work pretty well. Um, the, I didn't really push the range on it, but I know that that it was at least a half a mile on the 900 megahertz, at least, if not more. Wow. And didn't lose signal in the flight. It was about a 4,000 foot flight. Cool. And you were able to find it on the ground just fine too? Yeah, I was. Um, I had a little Yagi antenna on a stick. You know? Perfect. <laughs> so, good times. See, that's what you need, Jesse. You still Yo, I'm there. <laughs> a, little, a little PVC and a little Yagi goes yeah. a long mm -hmm. way. <laughs> All right. I want to be one of those guys that carries one of those around. I'm not going to lie. So that's why I mentioned you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And we've got uh, one from uh, Charlie here. And uh, his is on our last episode, episode 102, The Acronauts. Hey, guys. I just want to say another great show. Um, love listening to it. Love hearing all the excitement and the passion that you can definitely tell those kids have. It's so cool to see. And I hope to, that they're able to get some success and, and, and keep on pushing, you know, the sky's the limit for them. So, but I have a couple questions and in, in regards to some of the things that uh, the podcast brought up, like I know they drove a long ways carrying those rockets and an idea came up and it's probably going to be very important to me here in the next few months is how do you transport your rockets and how to protect them? when you're and you're traveling long distances like that my launch field is three and a half hours from me so and i got to be able to transport my rockets safely so they don't get all broken and, and dinged up because i like my rockets to look good and i don't want you know mm -hmm. damage to my rockets during transport uh if i have to have damage i want it to be during launch so that's my question <laughs> do you use um moving blankets or bubble wrap or what do you use um, second question is electronics. Do you just put your electronics in your rocket and, and transport it that way to keep them safe? Do you wrap them separately? How do you guys do that? And again, another great show. Can't wait for the next one. Thanks. All righty. Thank you. Okay. So we got two questions there. How do you, what do you use to protect your rockets? And I'm assuming it's when you drive. Mm -hmm. And then the next question, um, 
is how do you transport your electronics if that's yeah, correct, do you keep right? them in the rockets or do you take them out and protect them and yes mm-hmm. well um usually what i do is with my electronics bays for the rockets, I keep them up front with me on the passenger floor side. Um, I kind of wrap them when I have a bunch of old towels and I have loads and loads of old towels and I will wrap things in towels. Um, I keep the electronics bays ready to go because I like to prep them the night before <clears throat> and then right. wrap them up and make sure that the batteries are disconnected and um, get them ready and just wrap them up nice and safe and keep them in the front seat on the floor. The rockets, okay. um, I have a, a smaller car with a drop uh, trunk with a pass through. So I will take the birds and put them that way and wrap the heck out of the towels. That's, that's my method. Jesse, what are you? So I just recently bought a truck and, uh, when he said moving blankets, I don't know if I've actually talked to you about that before, Charlie. And just so everybody knows, I talk to Charlie about something every day because mm-hmm. he's fairly new to rocketry and he has a lot of questions. So we ping each other back and forth and share a lot of stuff. Um, so I don't know if I mentioned this to you before about the moving blankets, but yes, um, in the truck, um, let that big nuke four that I always talk about, right? I put that in the back of the truck and then I wrapped it in a moving blanket and then I just used um, bungee cords to keep it together. And mm-hmm. uh, of course, you want to make sure that you don't paint the rocket like two days before because mm-hmm. if you do that, guess what? going to happen <laughs> you're going to get etching of your blanket on your rocket so right. make sure that you let your rocket dry before you try doing that um, i have seen people do bubble wrap before if the rockets are like the size of a four inch goblin and then they've taken those and put in like those big tubs so yes i've mm-hmm. seen people re- do them in um foam not foam I-, I apologize either bubble wrap or um towels just like you said gene and then you put them inside of a tub that way you can put like two or three smaller rockets in there especially like some ncr like you know, mid power or maybe some aerotech size rockets. You just take the nose cone off, set it on the side and then lay the rocket in there nice and neat, you know, and then transport your rockets that way. That way you can close the lid. And if they're in the back of your truck, you know, chances are you're not going to get rained on. Um, I do have a cover on the back of my truck. So, uh, you know, it It actually keeps water out pretty well. I wouldn't quite take it through a car wash with that cover on, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, if it rained or something, I would be more than confident that my rockets would not get wet in the back of my truck. So bigger rockets, I'm going to say five and a half inch in diameter and up. I do uh, moving blankets and then I put bungee cords around them to keep them safe. They don't slide in the back of my truck because I got one of those rubber mats. If you have a car, then yes, do like just what Jim said, um, separate them into the two pieces, you know, your payload and your booster and then wrap them somehow. What's going to be good to protect your fins from getting dinged up and mm-hmm. banged, you know, just like you said, you're wasting a lot of time on these nice paint jobs if they're going to just get banged up in your car. <laughs> so yeah, I feel right. you, Charlie. That's that's a good, uh, that's good, good question, really. What do you, how, what how do, you do with your electronics? Them? Um, so my electronics, um, usually when I'm doing a big flight like that, um, I will just leave them, like you said, inside of the electronics bay. Mm -hmm. And then I do keep the electronics bay in the booster of the rocket with everything disconnected, just like you said, as part of my checklist, I will at that point, connect all the batteries, just like you mentioned, and then make sure to double check everything. Uh, sometimes I even take my multimeter and check the continuity of stuff, you know, just make sure I only mm-hmm, got all sure. my circuits connected and then put, put it back together. And then that allows me during my checklist time to make sure I got my um, shock, not, I would keep saying shock cords, but my recovery harness is attached. And then, you know, I can check my parachutes and everything then too. Uh, no, those are good monster. questions. Yeah. Uh, quick question, when these, um, you know, when the Acronauts went out, how did they transport their rocket? Because they had to drive the van, right? Mm-hmm. And then they had to carry mm-hmm. all that other stuff. How did they say that they were transporting theirs? Did we talk about that? Pretty much in the van, I think. Yeah, uh, we didn't. I don't think we went into the details of it, but um, they had. I think they had two vans, something like that. And then um, they rolled out. But we could always ask them and do a follow up. Yeah, you know, I was just wondering enough. about that. And when I took my kids out, um, <laughs> I mm-hmm. we actually UPS their rocket out to the out to far. And now the motor was an interesting. I bet that uh, was fun. <laughs> it was. Um, the motor was doing a mule around the country. It's like uh, you know, um, I I knew that somebody was going to Argonia for a launch, and so he got it that far for me. And then somebody else picked it up from there, and then um, took it uh, to some place in Colorado, and then some <laughs> guy in Colorado took it out to far. So it was this crazy I rocket dudes that. helping out. It was nuts. That's but, pretty wild. It was, but it was great. I mean, it was really, it just reminded me of how good the community is so that, you know, these guys would help mule a, an N5800, you know, <laughs> extended motor out there for us. It was great. We, we had the casing. They took the propellant. And for, gotcha. and for me, um, just like the rest of you guys, I just leave the electronics inside the electronics bay and, uh, and my electronics stays attached to the, uh, in my case, it's attached to the upper 
uh, the you know the parachute fairing part of the rocket because that's just the way mine are designed. Mm-hmm. And my so far the biggest rocket I've ever transported anywhere is about six feet and six feet tall, and I just separated at the you know the apogee point, and so it's two three foot sections. I just kind of set it in the car, so I don't really have any issues yet. Although that's going to change when I start getting into <laughs> level two stuff. So indeed, I'll, I'll, it will. I'll figure that out when when I cross that bridge. <laughs> you ever seen me hey, pull up with point. my Ultra Archer and my Corolla? No, I haven't. <laughs> oh man, that that'd be kind of fun to see. Yeah, it is. Hey, it's fun one, to drive to. one more thing is, I do have a backup RRC2 from Missile Works that I do keep with my range kit. And I just have that inside of a little anti static bag. Yes. And then I, you know, I have a piece of foam wrapped around that with a rubber band. Um, I mean, it's not going to, I don't have like tools sitting on top of it or nothing. It's in its own little compartment on my range box. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you're, if you have a spare that you're taking to answer that question, I mean, that's what I do. Snug I as a my bug in set. My trackers, I actually keep in a, it's a hard shell case, like kind of one of those Pelican waterproof cases for the trackers right. and things like that, That because I, I usually okay. attach that to the harness, you know, with uh, my Marco Polos or whatever, which is what I've been using lately. But I also have my computer and my connector to my straddle loggers in that case so that I can do something on the fly on the field if I need it. So that's nice. always nice. Very cool. Uh, do we have any, any other uh, mail? Yes, ah, okay. actually. Wait, I did got we answer one. the second question? Wasn't there a second question on that? The first one yeah. is how to transport the rocket. The other is the electronics. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no problem. All in one. Boom, yeah. boom. Boom, boom. I, I got a message from Rick Sharp on um, Facebook Messenger, and I thought I would just read it. Um, so this is for you, Rick. I like the podcast. I seem to catch most. Would it be possible, or maybe you've done it already, to do a segment on different altimeters? My TARC teams will have to use the Perfect Flight Fireflies because of price, size, and the info available from the reader unit. Although the reader units are impossible to find, I got one used. For myself, I fly mostly dual deploy. My favorite is the Perfect Flight CF Straddle Loggers, but they're not available. Not sure why. What are your group's thoughts on Raven, Missile Work, Egg Timer, or Ultras Metrum? Hmm. Interesting questions. Yeah. And I'm a I'm I'm a straddle logger guy. Yeah. Um, yes. For the most part, and they have been hard to come by. And <clears throat> I don't know if it's um, if it's what's going on with the company because the fireflies are still available. And that's because I just picked up five of those for my TARC team. And um, the interesting thing about the reader was that I called them and left some messages and they called me back and they said, we've got one. So if you want it, just let, you know, we'll add it to your order. I'm like, yes, please. So I was able to get the reader directly from them. Um, I think they're, there's having some problems with the production stuff due to COVID. And I think there's some of their suppliers in China, they've had some issues with that. So, but uh, fear not, they're, they're, they're still out there and um, hopefully soon we'll get some more straddle loggers. I do, um, I do have an RRC2 with the LCD reader. I picked up one of those just to play with it a little bit. I use it as a secondary altimeter because I usually fly dual altimeters on anything five and a half and bigger diameter. And I really, I, I like it. It's, um, you know, I'm like I said, I'm a straddle logger guy, but the R- RC2 is fast, convenient, and I like the little reader thing. I went ahead and got the uh, the case for it so I can put it in the field and not have bare electronics with a little ribbon cable. But um, it works. It works well. I um, haven't tried any of the other RRC stuff, um, but uh, that's that's my thoughts on it. I know that uh, there's a lot of guys use Ravens and Egg Timers, which we did a whole episode of. So I don't know if you caught that one, Rick. But uh, what do you guys have on it? Um, I have I use Stratologgers for the most part, and the only other altimeter um, I've got is one of the older AIM USB um, altimeters, which uh, yeah. which was damaged a while back in some rocket mishap. But I repaired that one and got it going. <laughs> uh, so it's just kind of sitting and waiting to go into something at some point. Um, other than that, it's just, you know, my own stuff after that. Uh, but, you know, this did this, this get me thinking. We should open it up um, for any of you out there, all of you rocket flyers. Send us your favorite electronics. We can help out uh, answer this question, but have it with yeah. uh, actual rocketeers. Either you can, you can mail it to us or you can use the SpeakPipe uh, voicemail system if you want and leave a message like the like Charlie and John did. Um, yep. And let us know your favorite ones and your, your thoughts. Um, yep. And we'll include it into a segment on the show to help answer that question. Your favorite altimeters and ones you would recommend other Rocketeers use and, uh, and why they're your favorite and why you would recommend them. There you go. 
And you can send your uh, emails to mailbag at therocketryshow.com or use SpeakPipe. How about that for an idea? Boom. I love it. And uh, before we head on out of here now, we're going to hit one last thing, some big news that broke in in between episodes. And that is the uh, big announcement from Mach 1. So who wants to read that press release? (laughs) Go for it, Jess. Yes. All right. <laughs> so, yeah. Sorry, guys. Thank you for being patient. All right. So, got a couple of quotes here that I'd like to read to you guys. Um, okay. First one here. Combining Mach 1 rocketry with my experience at Badass Rocketry will be an opportunity to offer unique innovation in the in the hobby in ways not seen yet in the industry. And that's what's so exciting. And so, uh, basically... Yeah, the key to this one is that he mentioned uh, badass rocketry. Mm-hmm. So those of you know who badass rocketry is, that would come from Mr. Ian Dalton. Yes, so badass rocketry um, buying Mach 1 rocketry. Yeah. So wow. um, Ian does have a partner, and our partner, Mr. Brett Anderson, says, customers are going to see that the homework has already been done by Mach 1. Careful thought and design and meticulous craftsmanship is only the beginning. I truly believe this is a favorite in the making. And everybody loves, you know, Steve Skinner and Ronald Dunn and what they've done with Mach 1 Rocketry. And um, mm-hmm. we have a quote from them that we'd like to read to you guys also. Cool. And uh, this is coming uh, from the founders. Uh, Never did Ronald and I envision Mach 1 growing so fast so quickly. We are glad to put this business into the hands of the next generation and watch them take it to the next level. We have every confidence that Ian and Brett will do just that. And that's from Steven Skinner and Ronald Dunn, who are the founders of Mach 1. I got to tell you guys, I'm very excited. Wow. Uh, I talk yeah. to all these guys all the time. And uh, when I first heard the news, I was ecstatic. I mean, I think I pinged you guys right away. And then I probably mm-hmm. sent, you know, a thousand mm-hmm. messages on Facebook. And <laughs> yeah, they're not going to be able to take orders until the beginning of March. So everybody just be a little patient. And if you have any orders that are pending, um, Ronald and Steve are still working on those. And just, uh, you know, make sure to contact them on the Frequently Asked Questions page on the Mach 1 website. But yeah, guys, it's exciting news. Very exciting. Yeah, that, it is. And I, I wish everybody well with that. I remember when we had Steve on the show, and that was that was good. Um, but they're all great guys, and I look forward to seeing what the next step for Mach 1 is going to look like. And we'll let you know. We're working on actually getting everybody on to talk about this big uh, transition. So they're uh, when they're ready, we will have them on, and uh, we'll, we'll find out together what the next steps are going to be and all this exciting awesome. things. Very excited. Very yes. excited. All righty. And uh, the next episode of The Rocketry Show, episode 104, will be another workshop episode with a guest in with us to talk rocketry uh, and, you know, <laughs> talk talk rocket shop. So that'll be a good thing for you guys and gals <laughs> in the rocketry. And so keep an eye out for that. And uh, in the meantime, keep your eyes in the skies all right everyone we'll see you next time around right here on the rocketry show at the rocketryshow.com and stay safe have a comment we'd love to hear it send them to mailbag at the rocketryshow.com if you enjoyed what you heard don't forget to check out our sister show the model rocket show.com The Model Rocket Show is hosted by the Rocket Noob and is all about low to mid-power rocketry. TheModelRocketShow.com with Daniel, the Rocket Noob. Check it out today. The views and opinions expressed on these programs are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Little Beth Entertainment or its sponsors.